Thank you. <clears throat> Lest I fail to follow proper protocol, I think I'll merely say, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll assume that that would include all those present. <clears throat> if it doesn't, certainly I'm not responsible. When you introduce someone, you're supposed to say nice things, and I do appreciate it. Don't make a difference whether they're true or not. Most of you don't know the difference, and <laughs> I think if the person inter being introduced on such occasions can keep things in perspective, there's no great harm done. I'd like to share with you something that I believe has helped me keep things in a little better perspective than I might have otherwise. In 1946, I was discharged from the service at the end of World War II and resumed the teaching position at a high school in South Bend, Indiana, that I, where I was prior to my enlistment in 1942. And in the April of 46, I was invited to a neighboring city of South Bend, Elkhart, to speak at a dinner that they held annually in which they honored anyone within the school system that had received any particular recognition during that school year. And you know that 25 years later, in 1971, they still recalled that. And I know they did, there's no question about it. The Elkhart Daily Truth, uh, it's a custom of the, of the daily newspapers in the smaller communities back in Indiana, at least, to have something in there under the heading, each day, one year ago today, Five years ago today, ten years ago today, and under 25 years ago today, in 1971, this little item appeared. Elkhart School Administrators announced today that John Wooden, English teacher coach from South Bend Central High School, would be the principal speaker at their recognition dinner, although they had hoped to get a prominent person. <laughs> I'd been away from, from that area for some time and, and since I left that area, actually in around 1946. But I was pleased at the many friends I still seem to have in Elkhart. I didn't realize it, but I must have had because they all sent me copies of this one <laughs> day's paper and they have a certain thing outlined and red arrows pointing to it and so on. So those things uh, do sort of help you keep things in a little better perspective than you might have otherwise. When I entered the teaching profession and after graduating from Purdue University in 1932, before too long I found myself a little bit disillusioned, disappointed, not particularly surprised at what I felt was undue pressures placed on youngsters in my English classes and on various athletic teams. It seemed that parents of my English students wanted an A or a B, and if they didn't get that, they, they tried to make their youngster or, or the teacher feel that they had failed. A C, the average grade, in spite of the fact that most of us are average, uh, was all right for the neighbor's children, of course. They were all average, but for their own, no. They didn't seem to like that. And uh, that isn't fair. The good Lord in his infinite wisdom didn't create us equal as far as intelligence is concerned, any more than we're equal as far as size. We're not equal as far as appearance. We are not born in the same environments. We do not all have the same opportunities. Not everybody can earn an A or B. I had youngsters that did very, very well that received only a C. I didn't like that way of measuring. Nor uh, I understood this more and it didn't bother me particularly because they judged uh, uh, athletic teams and coaches the same way in the 1930s as I suspect you people do today. If, if, if your alumni, if their team uh, that you follow wins them all, they're considered to be reasonably successful. <laughs> and I say that uh, not, partic not completely facetiously because of the fact that at UCLA, I, had, I did have several teams that didn't lose a game, but it seemed not once did we win each game by the margin that some of our alumni had predicted. <laughs> and I often had the feeling that they had backed up their predictions in a more materialistic <laughs> sort of way. 
I'll never forget the last game I ever coached against the University of Kentucky for the national championship in 1975 when one of UCLA's most illustrious, uh, wealthiest uh, alumnus donates heavily to every area of the university. He had an excellent seat, of course, the tournament. And uh, <laughs> the game is no more than over. And then he rushed down. He put his arms around me and he said, we did it. We did it. You let us down last year, but we got him this year. <laughs> Now, we didn't win the championship the year before after having won it seven years in succession prior to that, so I guess we had failed. <laughs> we did go to the final four in the tournament, and we did lose to the North Carolina State who won the national championship, and I thought North Carolina State had a decent team because they not only won the championship, they lost only one game in the entire season. But the problem with that is that one game that they lost during the season, they lost to us, and I've been reminded ever since that we won the wrong game. And I really don't need to be reminded of that. I'm well aware of the fact. <laughs> but I was blessed even then, as I think I have been. I was blessed that my late wife, my dear Nellie, whose husband never made the type of money to enable her to donate heavily to all these areas, her seat's higher. It took her longer to get down on the floor. And uh, as a result, he's still our friend, because she didn't hear what he had to say. Her maiden name was O'Reilly. That might, that might tend to give you an indication how she might react because she was Irish through and through. No, I understood that more, but the other I didn't. I began searching for something to help me become a better teacher and to give the youngsters under my supervision something to which to aspire other than just a higher mark or more points in some athletic contest. I didn't know how to go about it, but I wanted to do something. We all want success. I'm not sure we'd all agree on what success is, but we all want it. Mr. Webster defines it as the accumulation of material possessions or the attainment of a position of power or prestige or something along that line. And while I consider those to be worthy accomplishments, I don't think they necessarily indicate success. They might, but not necessarily so. And I wasn't going to be satisfied with that. And I wanted to find something else. And I think perhaps the teaching of my father to me and my three brothers, we were raised on a small farm in southern Indiana. And uh, uh, I think he tried to get across to us as something that may sound a little strange. At least the first part of it will be strange to you. He said, never try to be better than someone else. Learn from others all you can, but never try to be better than someone else. But never cease to try to be the very the best that you can be. That's within your power. The other isn't. And when you get yourself too involved with things that are beyond your control, it will only adversely affect the things that are under your control or should be under your control. I'm sure I didn't understand that at the time, but years later, it seemed that I uh, some of it did sink in. So perhaps I heard Mark Twain wrote something one time that said, um, when he was a boy of 14, his father was so ignorant he could hardly stand to be around him. But when he got to be 21, he was surprised how much his dad had learned <laughs> in those seven years. Well, it does take some things considerable time to sink in. So I think that helped me in my search, and I came up with my own definition of success. In 1934, I chose to define success as peace of mind, which can be attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to become the best of which you're capable. We're all equal in that respect. We can do that. We may not have the same facilities. The extenuating circumstances may be different. But we have an equal chance of making the most of the conditions that exist for us out of what we have and the opportunity to try to improve those conditions to the best of our ability. So if I were coining the definition for success today, I don't believe I'd change it from what I did in 1934. I wanted to get that idea across to the youngsters under my supervision. I wanted to try to live up to it myself. But it didn't seem to, to please me. It helped, but I'm not satisfied at all. And I tried to analyze it and determine why. And I finally came to the conclusion it's because this was just a definition, rather abject. You can't see it or feel it. 
hear it. Things we can see, I think, make a better impression, so I wanted to come up with something you could see. And here again, in the hidden recesses of the mind, something popped out that I had seen many years before called a ladder of achievement. Some person had taken a ladder with five rungs in the ladder and had named each rung of the ladder some personal trait or characteristic that this individual felt was necessary to get to the top of the ladder where we'd all like to get. Even though we might differ on what the top of the ladder is, we'd all like to get there. So obviously I couldn't use a ladder. But from that, that gave me an idea of the development of a pyramid. And I started in 1934 working on something that I chose to call a pyramid to success, and I completed it when I was teaching at Indiana State University just prior to coming to UCLA in 1948. At the apex, I placed success according to my definition. But in 1934, I placed two blocks as the cornerstones that I never changed through the years. I had a lot of different ideas and changed many things and dropped some ideas and substituted others or I changed the location within the structure of some things that I kept. But I never changed the cornerstones, the very, the two first blocks. One is industriousness, and the other is enthusiasm. You have to work hard. There is no substitute for work. Too many of us at times are looking for the shortcut, the easy way, the trick. And we may get by for a while, but we'll not be developing the talents that lie within us when we do that. There simply is no substitute for work. Grandlin Rice, I consider to be the greatest sports writer of all time. I'm most of you are too young to know much about him because he wrote in the 20s and 30s, but he wrote things in verse at times to illustrate points. And uh, I enjoy poetry. My master's thesis was in poetry. I dabble in it and enjoy uh, poems that make a point. Maybe not good poetry in a sense, but I enjoy all kinds, the good and that that isn't so good. He wrote something on how to be a champion and said, in part, you wonder how they do it, and you look to see the knack. You watch the foot in action, or the shoulder, or the back. But when you spot the answer where the higher glamours lurk, you will find in moving higher, up the laurel-covered spire, that the most of it is practice and the rest of it is work. There's another verse or two that say essentially the same thing. There's no substitute for work. The other corner of stone is enthusiasm. You have to enjoy what you're doing. It's a people-oriented world. You police chiefs have people under your supervision. You have to, you have to inspire them. You have to, to bring out their best. You have to be enthusiastic. If you want to affect them, you better be. And they're working with you, not for you. Never forget that. They're working with you, not for you. And you must have enthusiasm if you're going to stimulate them. I remember my first year at UCLA, I attended a meeting to hear a gentleman speak on a topic in which I had no interest at all. And you may say, why did you go? Maybe for the same reason as some of you here today. I don't know. <laughs> but it was my first year at UCLA. We hadn't won any championships or anything. And someone under whose supervision I was indicated it'd be nice if I was there. And I was there. I sat close to the front, too. I wanted him to note that I was there. I just hoped the fellow wouldn't talk very long. Before long, my attitude had changed. I was listening intently. I was sorry when he brought his remarks to a close, primarily for two reasons. He knew what he was talking about, and that helps. And the second was his enthusiasm. And he was enthusiastic, not in a loud, bombastic sort of way, but it radiated in his countenance and the sparkle of his eye. He loved his subject, and he knew his subject. A few days later, I had been in the, over at the administration building on the UCLA campus, and upon my return, coming by Powell a Library, with no intention whatsoever, I found myself in the library, browsing around the stack, seeking additional information in regard to a topic about which only a few days before I'd had absolutely no interest at all. A topic that has given me a lot of pleasure in all the ensuing years. Enthusiasm brushes off upon those with whom you come in contact. Between the cornerstones of this structure, I place three blocks that I think are strong because they include others. And if we include others, we're adding strength. One is friendship, another is loyalty, and a third is cooperation. Friendship, we must work at it. Too often we take it for granted, just as marriage is too often take, taken for granted. You must work at it, both sides, not just one side. It isn't friendship when someone's doing something nice for you. That's a nice person. 
But that isn't friendship. It isn't friendship until it becomes mutual and you do for each other. So you have to have it to be able to have the feeling of serenity and peace that will enable you to function near your own particular level of competency. And then loyalty. I deeply and firmly believe that we must have someone to whom we must be loyal and something to which we must be loyal in order to make the most of our abilities. And then cooperation. It's such a small world in which we live today. Modern science and technology, and I've seen it out here and going through the displays. Modern science and technology has changed so many things throughout the world. Modern means of transportation, the things that we see now, see actually happening in the Middle East. Seeing someone land on the moon. It's amazing what modern science and technology has done, which makes the world smaller and smaller, brings us closer and closer together, and demands that we have cooperation. And when you give, you receive. We must have cooperation. So that forms the foundation of this structure. The next tier, I have four blocks, self-control, alertness, initiative, and intentness. We must maintain self-control. When we lose our self-control, whether it be performing a physical act or making a mental decision, and certainly that is so important in police work, you can't let your emotions take over and make decisions, although you're in an emotional situation so often. Reason must always prevail. Because when emotion takes over, reason usually flies out the window. Suppose on a lighter vein you're playing golf. And I know that there are golf players in here. Lose your control. Lose your self-control, and I know where you'll be looking for the ball. Of course, I suspect most of you would be anyway, but if you lose your self-control, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to be out of the fairway an awful lot. Suppose it's disciplining your children at home. And our children cry out for discipline. I firmly, deeply believe that. Discipline, not punishment. Discipline doesn't have to be punishment. And when we punish so often, we antagonize. And it's so difficult to get productive results when we antagonize. You discipline to help, to prevent, to correct, to improve. And if you keep that in mind, I think you're far, far more apt to get productive results, whether it's your children at home or someone under your supervision. We have to have discipline. Yes, someone must be in charge. Someone has to make those terrible decisions and think of the decisions that are having to be made today in the Middle East. It's easy to make suggestions, and I suspect all of us in here would have some suggestions about what should be done or not be done. We don't have to make those decisions. It's a lonely position, but you must make decisions with reason must be done with reason and, and use uh, the, the, the information that you have in regard to the particular thing to the best of your ability, knowing that you'll be wrong at times. Alertness. There's something going on around about you from which you can learn. I've already spoken to a number of people that say they've learned something here already, and you'll learn more as this week progresses here at this, uh, these meetings. You, you, we must be alert and alive and observing, though. You've got to really study the things and be alert and see. There's things going on around about us all the time from which we can learn. But too often we get lost in our own narrow tunnel vision and we don't see the things that are there. You must be alert. When I think of alertness, I think of my favorite American, Abraham Lincoln. This great and gentle human being had the most unique and wonderful way of saying so much in a few words. I think his immortal Gettysburg Address, which is some 268 words, really says more than you'd find in many volumes. But he made many simple statements that mean so much and have so much depth to them. And one, I think of one with alertness. He has a sense of humor, too. He said he never met a person from whom he did not learn something, although most of the time it was something not to do. Well, that's learning, and we'll learn what to do and what not to do if we're just observant. He made such statements, too, as uh, you uh, can't, uh, you know, the worst thing you can do for those you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. 
Most anyone can stand adversity, but to test a person's character, give them power. He said, when being criticized near the end of the terrible war between the states, that he was being too lenient toward the South. And then someone said, I believe it's the Secretary of State, you're supposed to destroy your enemies, not make friends of them. And he said, am I not destroying an enemy when I make a friend of them? He said, it's better to trust and be disappointed occasionally than it is to distrust and be miserable all the time. And so many other things that I could go on and on. We must be alert. Then we must have initiative. Don't be afraid to fail. You are going to fail, you know, at times. You're not perfect. You must do what you think is right. Act according to the, your experience that you've had in the past. And when something requires action, act. The worst failure of all is the failure to act when action is needed, but act with reason. According to the experiences that you've had in the past that will help you in the particular situation that requires action. Don't be afraid to fail. And then the fourth block in this second tier is intentness. Now that is determination, it is persistence, it's perseverance, it's having goals, it's working hard toward those goals, it's knowing that uh, the road to them will be difficult. If it was easy, it wouldn't be worthwhile. It will be difficult, but within the realm of possibility. Your goals should be within the realm of possibility. And uh, you'll come against adversity. You may have to change your method. You may have to go around, under, over. You may have to back up, look at your waiver, start again. But you don't quit. You'll get stronger as a result of the adversity that you have. Someone once said, when I look back, it seems to me all the grief that had to be left me when the pain was o'er stronger than I was before. We got stronger through adversity, whether it's weight programs, whether it's more difficult subjects in school, whether it's being tested emotionally, spiritually, we get stronger through adversity. We should not dread it. We should know that it will make us stronger. Just above those four blocks, I have three. One is condition, the second is skill, and the third is team spirit, which is nothing more than consideration for others. You must be conditioned for what you're doing. It isn't just athletes that have to have conditioning. You have to have conditioning. Your officers must be conditioned in a certain way. Surgeons have to be conditioned, salesmen, housewives, nurses. You must be conditioned in certain ways, something that's within your power if you want to do it. Not difficult if you want to do it. If you don't want to, it's very difficult, yes. So you must, you must condition. To have physical condition, it must be preceded by mental and moral conditioning or you can never achieve it to the degree that's possible. And you must have it to be able to function near your ability level. Then you must have the skills. You must have the knowledge of and the ability not only properly, but quickly execute the fundamentals. I dare say your men in the field, if they can't respond quickly in situations, they lose their lives but they can't respond too quickly. They must be able to do it quickly, and they must know how. And this me must be able to be do it properly. I, I can sort of use an analogy in basketball. I've had some players who were great shooters. Oh, my, I could name some that were great shooters. Trouble of it is they weren't very quick, and they couldn't get any shots. <laughs> when we got into game time, and that didn't help us at all. <laughs> but I had some others that really, really could get all sorts of shots. Couldn't shoot, but... They can get them. That didn't help us either. You have to have both. You have to be able to do it properly and quickly to get desirable results. The third block, and that's center tier, is team spirit, consideration for others. Oh, how we need that. There's roles for all of us, and we must fill our roles. Some will be in the limelight more. We'll get more uh, credit, possibly undeserved at times, deserved at other times. But we must fill our roles in society, in the home, in our work, whatever we're doing. We must fill our roles, just as each player on an athletic team must fill his roles, just as our different services in the Middle East have to fill their own roles. It must be done. It's what the group accomplishes that really matters, not what the individual accomplishes. That must be put together for the benefit of the group as a whole. And it can be done. We must have that. 
you know it's a sad commentary in a sense that in the history of our civilization many wars have been fought and millions of lives have been lost because heads of state differed with others in regard to religion or regard to race millions of lives lost just because of that we just need consideration for others i believe if heads of state had more consideration for others more understanding Many of our problems in the past would not have been severe, as severe. They would be severe. We'd have problems. We would not eliminate them, but they, would, they wouldn't be nearly as severe. When I think of wars, I think of something that occurred, something personal that occurred to me in the 60s during the Vietnam situation, which I didn't understand, still don't. But I found myself extremely critical of young men who were running off to Canada or the Scandinavian countries or elsewhere to avoid the draft. I didn't want my grandsons to run away. I hoped they wouldn't have to go, but I didn't want them to run away. But I found myself very critical of those who were, and criticism of others doesn't help you when you feel that way. They don't know about it. It's like jealousy. Doesn't hurt them of whom you're jealous, hurt you. It's like envy. Envious of those others, doesn't hurt them, hurt you. It can become cancerous within you. Perhaps this was happening to me when I was flying cross-country on a trip for some reason or other, picked up a magazine on a plane, read something that I hadn't seen before, written by this sports writer, Granlin Rice. I thought I'd had uh, most of his works. I'd never seen this. He was in the infantry in World War I, was at the front in France, saw the horrors of war at the front, and after one terrible shelling, all German lines, Allied lines, German lines, Allied lines, then there'd be a lull. I suspect each side was bringing up more ammunition, and then they would continue again, and there'd be a lull. And after one terrible shelling, where many had been killed and maimed, he sat down and wrote some lines that he chose to call Two Sides of War. If I can remember, I'm not sure I can remember it real well, but I'll try. All wars are planned by older men in council rooms apart. They call for greater armament and map the battle chart. But out upon the shattered fields where golden hopes are gray, how very young the faces are where all the dead men lay. Poorly and solemn in their pride, the elders cast their vote for this or that or something else that sounds the warlike note. But where their sightless eyes stare out and gone are all their joys, I've noticed nearly all the dead were hardly more than boys. The average age of our fatalities in the teens, considerably older men sending them. This did not change my feeling about not wanting my own loved ones to run away, but it helped me get rid of some of this criticism which was becoming cancerous within me. I'm glad I made that particular trip. We accuse our youth of being impatient, but we're impatient as we get older too. All of us probably lack somewhat in patience. We should have more patience with our youth and understand that if there's a time of impatience, they have the feeling that they want to change things. And sometimes they feel that everything that they want to change is progress. But sometimes when we get older, we forget that there is no progress without change. So we must, we must be patient and we must have faith. We must have faith that things will work out as they should providing we do what we should. Sometimes we don't do what we should. We want things to work out this way without putting in the effort ourselves. Things should work. We, we, must, we must have the faith that they will work out as they should. With these blocks, I think we can reach peace of mind, which can be attained only through self-satisfaction that we'll have in knowing that we need the effort to become the best of which we're capable. I'll close my remarks with a quotation from another poem. I do not know the author, but the title of the poem is God's Hall of Fame. I use this various times, parts of it, with my athletic teams. Parts of it are very applicable. Perhaps all of it is, but one part goes like this. This crowd on earth, they soon forget the heroes of the past. They cheer like mad until you fall, and that's how long you last. 
So true in athletics. So true, so true. But God, he never does forget. And in his Hall of Fame, by just believing in his son, inscribed, you'll find your name. I tell you, friends, I would not trade my name, however small, inscribed up there beyond the stars in that celestial hall, for any famous name on earth or glory that they share. I'd rather be an unknown here and have my name up there. I think we all would. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Thank you.